Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Where are we going to? 2 Peter chapter 1. And let's continue our series addressing present truth. Amen? And uh, our thematic quotation is coming from the book Early Writings, page number 63. Amen? Amen, friends? Are you with me? All right. Father in heaven. Bless us now, we pray. Your words have been opened. Without your Holy Spirit, we cannot comprehend these words. We ask humbly, speak to us. Speak life into our bodies. For Christ's sake, amen. Look at what this says. There are many precious truths contained in the word of God. But it is present truth the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that aren't calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. But such subjects as a sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is. Read the next phrase with me. Establish what, my friend? The faith of the doubting. And that is where we want to focus this lesson of present truth, to establish the faith of whom? The doubting. And we're told in the book, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 357, that the message of righteousness by faith, it is present truth. It says this, we thank the Lord with all the heart that we have precious light to present before the people. And we rejoice that we have a message for this time which is present truth. The tidings that Christ is our righteousness has brought relief to many, many souls. And God says to save to serve. God says to his people, what two words? He says, go forward. And we have been seeing that God is not going to bring the seven last plagues, his second advent, until the message of present truth, the righteousness of Christ, is both proclaimed and received. It says this, volume six, testimonies, page 19. The Lord God of heaven will not send upon the world his judgments for disobedience and transgression until what? He has sent his watchmen to give the what, my friends? The warning. He will not close up the period of probation until the message shall be more distinctly proclaimed. The law of God is to be magnified. Its claims must be presented in their true, sacred character, that the people may be brought to the side for or against the truth. Yet the work will be cut short how? In righteousness, the message of Christ's righteousness is the sound from one end of the earth to where? The other, to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory which closes the work of what message? The third angel. And here we have it now. Gospel workers, page 301. It says this. This I do know, that our churches are dying. What condition are they in? They are dying. Dying for what? They are dying for the want of teaching on the subject of righteousness by faith in Christ and on other kindred truths. And as we discovered last week, when I think about righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ, the patriarch Abraham comes to my mind. Because in the Bible, Abraham is called the father of the faithful. 
the father of the righteous. Talk to me. Who was Abraham's son, the promised son? Who was he? Isaac. And Isaac grew and married. Who was his wife? Isaac. Rebecca. And they both had two sons. What were their names? Esau and Jacob. And what promise did God give to Isaac and Rebekah when Esau and Jacob were born? What was that promise? That the older, the elder, shall serve whom? The younger. Let's read that. Genesis chapter 25. Where are we going to, my friends? As a matter of fact, look with me. Genesis chapter, yes, 25. And look with me here at verse number 23. The Bible says this, Genesis 25 and verse number 23. And the Lord said unto her, unto Rebekah, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people. Let's read now. And the elder shall serve whom? The younger. Who was the elder? Esau. The younger? Jacob. And the Bible says now that the elder Esau must serve whom? Would serve whom? Would serve Jacob. Put down on your paper here. Notes. Take notes. Take notes. Jacob was then to be the heir. The what, my friends? The heir. The inheritor of the blessings. Of the what, my friends? The blessings that God had been bestowed. That God had promised to Abraham. That God promised to Isaac. And all those blessings that God promised to Abraham and to Isaac, Jacob was now to be that heir. Jacob was now to be that inheritor. Again, all the blessings God had bestowed upon Abraham, upon Isaac, those promises that were to flow through them to the world. Those promises were now to flow through the younger, Jacob, as the heir. So now, what promises did God give to Abraham? Write these four points down. What promises did God give to Abraham? Number one, there were many. I'll give you four. Number one, did God promise Abraham the promised land? Did he, my friends? Yes. Did God promise Abraham that he would become fruitful? Yes. Did God promise Abraham that through you, Abraham, kings shall come out of thy bowels? Yes, did God promise Abraham, number four, that through Abraham, the seed would come. Genesis, go there with me. And what we shall see, the same promises that God gave to Abraham, to Isaac, those same promises God is giving to us today. Where are we going to, my friends? Genesis chapter 17. Look with me. Verse number five. The Bible says this, neither... God talking to Abram, neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations, don't forget this, have I made thee, and I will make thee how? How, my friends? That's the first, exceeding fruitful. Don't miss that. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. There it is. Verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed. There it is. And thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy whom? And to thy whom? And to thy seed. After thee, and verse number 8 now, the promised land, and I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the what, my friends? The land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That God gave him a covenant promise, and within this, this promise, 
There are four specific things. Number one, I have promised to give you that land. Did Abraham ever possess fully that earth land? No. So what land was this? Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham says, I look for a better country. That is an heavenly. So what promise is God making to us right now? Does God also want to give us the heavenly Canaan? The heavenly promised land. Even the earth made new. Yes or no, my friends? If that's clear, say amen. And number two, did God promise Abraham, I will make you fruitful? Does God want us to be fruitful? Does he? What is in John, John 15? I am the vine. You are the what? The branches. If you abide in me and I in thee, you shall bring forth, you shall bear what? Much fruit. Does God want us to bear fruit? And what is in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and verse 23? The fruit of the Spirit, and God gives us nine parts of the one fruit. Does God expect us to bear fruit? Again, does God expect us to enter the heavenly promised land? Do you know before that? Does God expect all of us to be in the rural districts? To be in the country? To get ready for the coming crisis? Does he expect this of us? All right. It's the same covenant promise. I have a place for you. And just as Christ said in John 14, Ah, oh, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Why? For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and what now? Prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be. Does God have power to prepare a place over there in heaven for us, even on the new earth? Do you believe that? Again, do you believe that? So if you believe that, why doubt that Jesus also has a place a place in the country, in rural districts for you to get ready for the little time of trouble, character building, and to grow your own produces. Why? In the future. Maranatha, page 185. For in the future, the problem, the problem, the problem, and page 162. For in the future, Maranatha, one, six, two. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. And also put down Adventist home. Page 141. Back to the promise that God also promised Abraham, out of him kings shall come. Yes. Now, did, did we see kings sit on the throne of Judah and Israel? But the kings in the last days don't point to men, royal men, sitting on an earth throne. So who will these kings represent? The kings will represent those who are converted by Jesus Christ and are ready for the second coming of Christ. For when Jesus comes, how does he come? What name does he bear when he comes? The Bible says he bears this name as King of Kings. So this means then the promise to Abraham out of the king shall come. It points to evangelism. Hold your place in the book of Genesis. Run over with me to Revelation chapter 1. Where are we going to my friends? Revelation chapter 1. This is evangelism. Jacob would be the heir. He must evangelize to prepare kings for the coming of Jesus. And that same covenant promise that God gave to Abraham, also to Isaac, and then Jacob would become the heir. That same promise is for us. 
evangelism. Chapter 1, are we there, my friends? Verse 5, look at Kings. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the whom? And the prince of whom? The kings of the earth unto him that loved us. And what, friends? And washed us from what? From, from our sins. In his own blood, verse 6, and hath made us how? And has made us who? Kings. So who are these kings, my friends? Those who are converted, those who receive victory over sin, they are washed from their sins by the blood of Jesus. And what does blood typify in Scripture? The life of the flesh is where? It is in the blood. The kings put down beside verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 6 for kings. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 16 that Jesus returns as what? Kings, capital K. Kings of kings, Laura K. This is our mission. Then the Bible says the promise was given to Abraham that through Abraham the seed would come. Who was that seed to come? That seed was Jesus. Galatians chapter 3. Go there with me. And what is God saying? That seed was Jesus. That Abraham was to so live that through his lineage Christ would come. The seed. And God is saying to us that same promise was given to Jacob. Jacob so live that through you, your lineage, the Savior may come. That's the first advent. We now are called to be God's heirs. We must so live that we can prepare the world for the second coming of Christ and to usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Christ's object lessons. Page 6 to 9 says, Jesus is waiting. Just imagine the passions and the emotions. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in the church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people then he will come to claim them as his own it's our privilege not just to look for but to hasten his coming through you Andrew through you, safe to serve. Through you, Seventh-day Adventists. Through you, Bible-believing Christians. The seed should come, Galatians. Chapter 3. Are we there, my friends? Look with me. Verse number 16. Look at this. Now to Abraham and his what? His seed. Were the promises made. God saith not unto seeds. As of what? Many. Not plural seeds. And to seeds as of many. No, God didn't say that. What did God say? But as of one. And to thy seed, singular, which is whom? Which is Jesus the Christ. We must so live as the heirs to prepare and to usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And for us to receive. Those four promised blessings that God gave to Abraham, God gave to Isaac, God also said Jacob would be the heir of those promises. We have to fully accept Jesus Christ. We have to completely surrender all to Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3, read verse 29 with me. What it says there, my friends. You know what? I want verse 27 first. What it says there. Because, friends, baptism is coming up. And God has been saying to many of us, we need to be rebaptized. We need to be converted anew. Baptized in present truth. And don't go backwards, my friends. Verse 27. Are we there? It says this. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
verse 29. And if you be Christ, that word Christ has an apostrophe S. It's a possessive noun. And if you be Christ, if you belong to Christ, because you are baptized into Christ, read on. Then, read on. Then, are ye Abraham's seed? And what now? And heirs according to what, my friends? That promise. What promise that God gave to Abraham? Romans chapter 4. What promise did we discover God gave to Abraham? That God say that land is yours. The promised land. Not this one, but that one in heaven. Amen. And the earth man knew. Did God promise Abraham, you shall be fruitful. I will make you fruitful. You must believe it, my friends. Do you believe it? He can make us fruitful. And number three, through you kings shall come. Number four, the seed shall come. You will usher in the second coming of Christ. Romans chapter four. Are we there, my friends? Look at verse 13. Verse 13 tells us something very critical, very important, that Abraham, had to receive something in order to receive the blessings. Look at verse 13. Are we there, my friends? It says this. For the promise that Abraham should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through what, my friends? Ah, oh, beloved. So what was the conduit, the channel by which Abraham would receive the promised blessings. What did Abraham have to receive and experience? What is in verse 13? But through the righteousness of faith. Ha. Huh. So now, since this was how Abraham was to receive God's blessings, righteousness by faith, how would Jacob have to receive those blessings? Through what medium? Righteousness by faith. By what medium should I, should you, receive God's promised blessings? What, my friends? Righteousness by faith. What is righteousness? We discovered this last week. What is righteousness? It is right doing. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. Why? For he that doeth righteousness is what? Righteous as God is righteous. It's right doing by faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11 verse 1. For now faith is the substance, substance of things. Hold for the evidence of things not seen. So what must be the primary thing that we must hope for to do that which is right righteousness that's it and even if we don't see how this can be accomplished in our lives what must we do we must believe it believe it is that point clear so jacob was to receive the promises of god by doing that which was right by faith Righteousness by faith. However, what did Rebecca and Jacob conspire to do? Plot to do. What did they carry out to receive the promised blessings that God gave to Jacob? Did they commit sin? How was that sin manifested? Did they, de did they deceive Isaac? Think about this. How could you commit sin and expect to receive God's blessing? That's not faith. That's not faith. That's presumption. To sin against God and expect to receive the blessings of God, it is presumption, not faith. So what is faith? To do what is right by his strength. Then we can expect the blessings of God. That is right doing by faith and not presumption. Genesis 27, go there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? And this is what righteousness by faith is. Not committing sin and then expecting 
a blessing. Oh no, my friends, it is doing that which is right, that which is pleasing, that which is honorable in the sight of God, and then you can expect the blessings of God, the power of God, the deliverance of God. Chapter 27 of Genesis. Are we there, my friends? Now, in verse number 1 through verse 3, what did Esau tell Jacob to do? Because he was about to die. Pardon me. What did Isaac tell Esau to do as Isaac was about to die? Get your weapons, right, your instruments, and go, go hunting and catch something and make what for me so I can eat. Make savory meat. You see, Isaac loved his belly too much. Make savory meat. And of course, Rebecca heard it. And Rebecca now told whom? She turned to whom now? Jacob. Jacob. Not Esau. Jacob. Amen. Amen. Jacob. And what did she tell Jacob to do? Watch these three points. She told Jacob now, you go to the herd and gather now two goats, two kids of goats. Bring them to me and I, Rebecca, will make savory meat for Isaac because he loved his belly. And notice now, my friends, and then Jacob looked at his mother and said, oh no, mom, this is sin. This is wrong in the sight of God. But what did Rebecca look at, looked at Jacob and say? I know it's wrong. A curse will come, but I will bear the curse. I wonder what God is saying to a mother and a child in these last days. Here is a mother leading her children to damnation, to sin against God, in the process to receive salvation, the promises of God. Oh, my friends, that's dangerous. Look with me carefully. Look at this. In verse 13, are we there, my friends? Verse 13, this is, this is verse 12. Verse 12, my father, peradventure, will feel me. And I shall see to him, seem to him as a deceiver. And I shall bring a curse upon me and not the desired blessing. And Rebekah said unto Jacob, upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice. And that's why we're told in Ephesians, you know it now, children, children, one more time, children, obey your parents, period, period, right? No, in the Lord, my friends, honor thy father and thy, okay, we know it. Look at number 14, now verse 14. I wonder what is God saying to us? Hmm? Parents and children, that's why children, you need to know Christ for yourself. Amen. That when mom and dad, dad go off course, if you're still living under their roof, you must respectfully and humbly with tears in your voice say, mom and dad, that's not the will of God. Amen. Do not disrespect your parents even when they're wrong. Amen. But when you move out, it can be more firm. Amen. Amen. All right. You can rebuke now because you pay your own bills. Amen. Amen. But rebuke in the Lord. What is God saying to us, my friends? Watch our parents will lead children astray. Amen. Let that sink in. Then Jacob now said to Rebecca, oh, mom, my father is blind. Eyes are now dimmed based on verse one. Oh, I can't stop right there. Let me move on. Eyes were dim. Laodicea, Isaac, can't stop right there. And my father Isaac will begin to feel me. And my skin is smooth. Esau's skin is hairy. He will discern and recognize I am not Esau. And the mother said now in verse 15, never mind, I already have that under control. I'm two steps ahead of you, Jacob. Here now, Jacob, take this goodly raiment and put it on to deceive Isaac. 
It's interesting. Now, since Jacob would put on this raiment to deceive Isaac, my question is now, was he a part of this deception? Yes, he was. He put it on, my friends. And notice, what does a raiment, a garment, typify in Scripture? Character. So what character did Jacob put on? A true character, a true genuine character, or a deception? falsified character it's the latter and the sad reality is that Rebecca called the Raymond good look at verse 15 does this remind you of somebody else in scripture who was this this was Achan Achan took this Babylonish garment and called it good Lord have mercy upon our souls. Verse 15, and Rebekah took what? Goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. We get the point. So now Jacob was wearing what character now? A deceptive character. His character was now marred by whom? Who was a seamstress of Jacob's evilest character? The mother. What is God saying to us in the household? Because when Elijah comes, Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 through verse 6, when Elijah comes, he sets the home in order. Rebecca was a seamstress. Yes. And she fashioned a deceptive character for her child and yet promising him blessings in sin. Lord have mercy upon our souls. Then number three, the third thing was, look at verse 18. And then now, when Jacob went before Isaac, Isaac asked Jacob one question, who are you? And what was Jacob's response? Look now, friends, did Jacob take two steps in deception? Did he carry the savory meat? The first step in deception, did he put on the deceptive raiment? The second step in lies. And God allowed Isaac to ask him one last question. At this point, what did Isaac ask him? Who are you and what should Jacob have done? Three strikes are out. What should Jacob have done? <laughs> oh, father, and repent and confess of his sins. But what did Jacob say in verse 19? Verse 18, and he came unto his father and said, my father, and he said, here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. He signed the very compact with his own signature that Rebecca had drafted. His signature was on it now. Both were a party to this deception, and yet what were they expecting? The promise, blessing of God for Jacob to be the heir of those promised blessings that God gave to Abraham. And we know what happened now, right? Later on in verse 27 through verse 29, what did Isaac do now? Did Isaac pronounce the blessing on Jacob thinking it was Esau? He did. But guess who came in afterward? Did Esau learn of the deception done by Jacob? And what did Esau determine to do now to Jacob in verse 41? To kill him. And what happened to Jacob? What did Jacob have to do now? Jacob fled for his life. A refugee. A vagabond, as it were. Up, oh, my friends, running. But notice now, 
Did he not desire to get the blessing? Did he lie and deceive to get the blessing? And once he received that blessing, what happened in his life? He began to suffer. So what is God saying to us? To lie, to deceive, to receive a blessing that you call a blessing from God will only make your life miserable, will cause you to be cut off even from your family. And guess what? Did Jacob ever see his mother again? Lies and deception will cause you to be separated from your earthly family. But more so, but more so, but more so, from which family was Jacob severed from? From which family was Jacob severed from? The heavenly family. Heavenly family. Why? Because of lies, deception, falsehood, trickeries, just to gain some earthly blessing. And when he received it, how do you think Jacob must have felt now? Do you think he must have felt as if he wanted to give it back? If this is what this brings to me, I don't want it. Fleeing for his life. Search your heart right now. Father in heaven, is there somebody inside here? Are there people inside here? Even Save to Serve International online right now. Have they committed falsehood, trickeries, deception to get things in their lives? They called those things blessing. To even get a spouse. And by marrying the spouse based on deception and trickeries, now there is grave problems in the marriage. Lord, have mercy upon our souls that we may learn from this point to do right things by your grace. Then we can hope for the blessing, not to lie, to receive blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go back with me. Genesis chapter 27. Skip on over. 29 now of Genesis. You know, friends, C.D. Brooks once said he was giving a family a counseling session. And uh, the woman-to-be wife, the woman-to-be wife said, Oh, Pastor Brooks, if I don't get him, I'm going to die. I want him, Pastor Brooks. <laughs> if I don't get him, I'm going to die. And C.D. Brooks said, The amount of lies and deception she worked to marry this man. And when she did, she came back a few months afterward. And guess what she told him? It's misery. I feel like dying. In the marriage. Why? No different from Jacob. Lying. Deceiving. To receive a blessing. And once he received that blessing, now he's fleeing for his life. Severed from his family. Severed from heaven. Do you think he felt like committing suicide now? How would you feel? Do you know how many times Satan taunts us? When due to our sins, we bring misery upon ourselves. Do you know it's that time the devil desires to kill us? Because he knows if we die then, we die lost. Right there. Just imagine the demons at this point surrounding Jacob. Fleeing for his life. Demons whispering in your ears. It's over, it's too late. Just in your life. And the Bible says now, as the sun was about to set, Jacob became tired. Sleep was over Jacob. And Jacob stopped and took a stone for his pillow. And laid upon that pillow and began to sleep. And God gave him a dream. God gave him a vision. And what did God show Jacob in that dream, in that vision, based on the context of our study? God showed him a what, my friends? A ladder. And the top of the ladder was where? All the way up there in heaven. 
and the bottom most rung was where? All the way where Jacob's feet was. In this context, what was that symbol saying to Jacob? You were once severed. As if God is saying, Jacob, I know how you feel. Oh, my friends, as if God is saying to us, I know how you feel. I know how you feel when you sin. Even when you sin, may I say it this way? Even when you sinned sincerely. That's what Jacob did. And Rebecca, because they were so-called sinning to get the blessing. But there's no such thing. Sin is sin, amen. Sin severs us from heaven severs us from our family, severs us from our friends, our kindred. I know how you feel, Jacob. And I can now recall the principle of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Amen, my friends. Does God know how we feel when we sin again, even sin sincerely? It's willful sin. He knows how we feel. Severed from him. Severed from salvation. But here came the ladder. Amen, my friends. For what purpose now? In the context now? To reconnect Jacob with heaven. To reconnect Jacob with his heavenly family. And what did Jacob see on that ladder? Ascending and descending. Who was at the top of the ladder? It was Jesus Christ himself. Angels ascending and also descending. Why ascending first? Why ascending first to bring our prayers up there? It doesn't say the angels were descending and ascending. No. Ascending first, bringing what, my friends? Our prayers, our cares, our concerns, our troubles up there. Then what came down? The angels. Who are angels? We know supernatural beings. These are messengers. And messengers must have a what? A message. And where can we find God's messages? His promises. His promises. His promises. And now notice now, did God ever give somebody else a similar vision? With a ladder and angels ascending and descending. Who was that person in the New Testament? That was Nathaniel. In John chapter 1, right, Christian? That was Nathaniel. In John chapter 1, verse 47 down to verse 51, Christ said to Nathaniel, Here is an Israelite indeed. From henceforth you shall see what? Heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Wait a minute. In John chapter 1, who did God give that vision to? Of the latter? Who? To an Israelite indeed. And what did God afterward change Jacob's name to? Israel. So from that vision, God was preparing Jacob to become a true Israelite. Do you see that, my friends? And who was that latter? It was Jesus. So now what did Christ do to reconnect earth with heaven? To reconnect us who are sinners with heaven. What did Christ do, my friends? Uh, Jesus had to die on Calvary's cross. So what, what was God showing to Jacob? The only way, Jacob, you can receive the heavenly blessings is to carry that cross. And Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let's go again. Let him do what now? De one more time. Let him what now? Deny himself. Take up the cross how often? 
daily. How often must we deny ourselves daily? And now what? Follow me. But earlier, what did Jacob and Rebekah do? They did not deny themselves. Do you see it now? They did not take up the cross daily and wait upon God and to follow God. One of the main problems with Rebekah and Jacob was that they did not have patience in Christ. God gave a blessing, but they did not have patience. What is God saying to us, friends? What is God saying to us? And look at the context. Why did Rebekah plot that deception with Jacob? Because Rebekah heard Isaac was about to bless Esau. What did she see? She saw someone about to interrupt the blessing. But that was providence. That was a test. You don't hear me, my friends. And many of us, we see people, we see things in our lives about to interrupt God's promised blessings. As a result now, we don't wait upon God. We don't pray to God for strength and patience to believe. Even though circumstances may look negative, I'm still going to claim your promises. Because think about this, if Isaac had even blessed Esau, could Isaac change God's word? So God would have worked it out that Jacob would have received the blessing anyway. It's to trust God, even though circumstances may look unfavorable. And that's why we are told in Testaments for the for the church, volume three, book it, page 47. If we are creatures of circumstances, we shall surely fail in perfecting Christian characters. Did you get that? May I rewind? If we are creatures of circumstances, we shall surely fail in perfecting Christian characters. We must master our circumstances and don't allow circumstances to master us. Amen. Here comes the hope now. We can find energy. We can find power at the cross, at the ladder of Christ. Rebecca, Jacob saw somebody that was about to interrupt the promised blessing of God, Jacob and Rebekah, were creatures of circumstances. Do you see it now, friends? What is God saying to us? We cannot be creatures of circumstances. It doesn't matter how things look in your life. Go back and claim God's promises. Back to Genesis. Go there with me and look what God did now. I want to ask you a question, my friends. If you were God, and you gave to Jacob the promise. He grew up. He heard he would be heir of that same promise. God gave to Abraham. God gave to Isaac. And you saw that Jacob sinned so horribly. Would you turn around and give Jacob a second chance? Would you? Not, not really. Lord, I'm so glad you're not God. Not really. Why not really? <laughs> because the human nature. But notice now, Jacob was separated, severed from heaven. When God gave Jacob that vision of the ladder, what did God say to him? God repeated the promised blessings he gave to Abraham. Look at this, my friend. What a God we serve. At this time, Jacob had sinned. In his sins, God repeated the promise. Oh, beloved, do you see that? In his sins, God gave him the gospel. God gave him what? Don't forget that. Look at verse 14. God appears now, and verse 14, God says now, I will give you the land. That's verse 13. Verse 14, and thy seed 
shall be as the dust. Amen. And you could read that. The last phrase of verse 14. Last phrase of verse 14. In thy seed shall what? All the families of the earth be blessed. Who got those same words in a promise? Abraham, hold your place right here and go now to Galatians chapter 3. In his sins, God gave to Jacob the gospel. The what, my friends? Look at this. Galatians chapter 3. And look with me at verse number, let's begin here. In verse number, verse number 8. Are we there in verse 8? Let's read that. It says this, and the scripture foreseeing that God would what? <clears throat> that what, my friends? That God, watch carefully, would justify, it says, would justify the heathen through faith. Let's read slowly now. Preached before the what now? The gospel unto Abraham Saying what now? In thee shall all nations be what? Blessed. Go back with me now. So what did God preach to Jacob? The gospel. Do you see it, friends? While he was in sin, God gave to Jacob the gospel. What do we need today? And what is that gospel called based on chapter 14 of the Revelation? It is the everlasting gospel. Is it present truth? In that gospel do we find righteousness by faith. Watch this now. When Jacob, who felt severed from heaven, felt and saw how God was saying to him, I, Jacob, want to reconnect you with me. Jacob felt so much love that Jacob said, from this day forward, I'm going to surrender all to you. Amen. Do you see what caused Jacob to surrender all? When in his sin, he heard and received the pardon and the love of God. Amen. And what will cause us to surrender all to Jesus? When in our sins, we feel, we hear, we experience the love of God to save us from our sin when we should be cut off and be cut off forever. This is why Jacob said these words now. In verse number 16, and Jacob, uh, no, uh, no, 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 I can't read that yet. Go to verse 15. And behold, God said to him, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And I, Jacob, will bring thee again into this land. And I, Jacob, will not leave thee. Mercy. Oh, my friends, I want mercy. How about you? God is saying, I will not leave thee until until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. What is God saying to us? He will not leave us until we surrender all to him or until we grieve his spirit. That's hope. Yes, we are weak, but God is saying, I know you are weak. I know you feel like you have been severed from heaven, but Jacob, I will not leave you until I bring fruit in your life. And as long as you remain humble, I will complete the work. What a God we serve. With such words ringing in his ears, that night Jacob did not have a nightmare. Amen, my friends. Look at verse 16 now. And Jacob, and when I read this, put yourself in Jacob's place. And Jacob now, Awaked out of what, my friends? You know what? Let me say this. How many sons did Jacob have? Twelve. And what are they called in the book of Revelation, chapter 7 and chapter 14? The 144,000. So this experience must be whose experience? Ours. Look at verse 16 again. That's for context to awaken us. Jacob, awake now and said, surely... The Lord is where? In this place and 
I knew it not. In the context, why would Jacob say those words? God is in this place and I knew it not. Why would he say those words now? Because he knew, based on his sins, fleeing from home, severed from home, he was severed from heaven because Jacob had said earlier to Rebekah, if I do this, I will not receive a blessing. I will receive a curse. That means Jacob was waiting just for God to speak the word and he would drop dead. That's it. That's why he could say with passion and ethos, he could say, my friends, God is in this place and I knew it not. In other words, he never understood the mercy, the love, the long suffering of God until that moment. And we will never comprehend the mercy, the pardon, the long suffering of God until we find ourselves in deep waters. You mean God still gives me the gospel? You mean God still allows me to come to church? You mean God still give me the desire to read and pray? God is in this place and what now? Say those words, read on, verse 17. This is the house of God. This is the gate of... So where did Jacob see himself now? At the gate of heaven. Even though a few moments earlier, he felt as if he had received the curse of God. By the way, what is the curse of God for these last days? The seven last days plagues, yea, the second death. Verse 18, and Jacob arose now. I'm going to read this because we're going to come back to it. Verse 18, and Jacob rose up early in the morning and took what now? The stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a what now? A pillar. What was Jacob doing now? He was establishing what? Talk to me. An altar? He was also establishing what the Bible calls an Ebenezer. What is an Ebenezer? It is an experience by which God gives deliverance. God gives a breakthrough. And later on in life, when you find yourself in a difficult place, you look back. And you draw strength from that past experience. Since I was cut off then... And God found me there and repeated to me the gospel, the promise. Now I can draw strength today. The songwriter says, here I raise my Ebenezer. Heather by thy help I've come. And I know that by thy good pleasure, by thy good pleasure, safely to arrive where, my friends? At home. Uh, you can sing that. Verse 19. Let's sing it out. Jesus sought me when I was a what? A stranger. Wandering from the fold of God. Oh, and what experience was Jacob having? Did he feel like a stranger from his family, from God? Was he a wanderer in the earth now? Yes. Ebenezer. Verse 19. And he called the name of that place. What now? Bethel. What, what does Bethel mean? The house of God. And verse number 20, and Jacob did what now? And Jacob did what now, my friends? The Bible says, and Jacob vowed a vow saying, this must be our vow. Friends, wake up. This is devotion. When you are having devotion and you go to a scripture, if the scripture is an instruction, you ask God for power to live out the instruction. If the verse is a promise from God to Jacob, you say, Lord, help me today to claim and to believe this promise is mine now. And help me to wait, give me patience to wait until my faith becomes a reality. My faith becomes sight. Oh, if it's a prayer, you make it your prayer. So go to verse 20 now. What did Jacob say now? He vowed a vow. He's praying. 
He's communing with God, saying what now? If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. So he wanted another raiment now. Because he realized, oh my friends, he realized he had put on a deceptive raiment. Do you see confession here now? Surrender here now. What led to this? The gospel of Christ's love. Christ's pity. Chills on my body, my friends. Mm, mm, mm. Jacob, this is the experience of the 140 and 4,000 friends. You want to be saved? Let this be yours. Lord, give me a new raiment. Give me the true bread. What are we getting today right now? Bread from whose bakery? From heaven's bakery. And then verse 21. So that I come again to my father's house in peace. What did he say then? Then shall the Lord be what now? My God. And verse 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, dear God, of all that thou shalt what now? What was he claiming? The promised blessings. Because now we knew if he were to surrender, the promised blessings would now be his and he would not be selfish. Whatever you give me, I'm going to give you back yours. I will give you a tenth. Would you say amen, friends? Amen. Would you say amen, friends? Amen. And why God asks us for a tenth is to remove selfishness from our hearts. Amen. That's it, friends. Is this your prayer today? And notice now, notice, even though God gave to Jacob a repetition of the promised blessings, it took 20 years for the blessings to be realized. Why did he take 20 more years? Because earlier, if he had been patient in the house of Isaac and Rebekah, God would have worked it out. It would not have taken 20 years. And many of us are delaying our own blessings. Five years. 10 years for many of us, 12 years, yea, 20 years, because you lied, you deceived to marry somebody, you knew it wasn't God's will, 20 years. You lied to buy the house, and now you can't pay the bills, 20 years. Oh, my friends, you make your application, 20 years. And let me tell you something. In those 20 years, Jacob was tested. But he remained faithful. Do you know why? He remembered Bethel. He remembered where? Bethel. Look at this. Genesis chapter 31. Where are we going to, my friends? So why are many of us still in a wilderness not receiving the blessings. Why is it many of us have not yet crossed Jordan? Maybe you missed that. Maybe I'm speaking in parables now. Before Israel could cross into Canaan, what did they have to cross over? Jordan. But where were they? In the wilderness doing what? Doing what? My, going in circles. Circles going backward. Many of us have not yet entered a Canaan because what? We are lying and stealing still. We're living a lie. That's it, friends. And when God gave this man, this patriarch, the promise again, why do I say it took him 20 years? Why 20 years? Where did I get 20 years from? He worked how many years to receive Rachel? Well, it was seven years for Rachel, right? But Laban gave him home, Leah. Wow. What goes around? What goes around? And it's interesting that when Jacob said to Laban, Laban, I will work seven years 
for Rachel on that very night of the marriage. Hmm. Laban gave him whom? Leah. And when he confronted Laban, do you know what Laban said to him? It's, it should not be done so. It's not done so in, in this land. Where the younger is given over first. Do you know how stinging that was to Jacob? Why would I say so? It's right there. It's right there in, 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 in Genesis 29 and verse 26. And Laban said, it must not be so done in our country to give what now? The younger before the firstborn. Why would he say firstborn to Jacob? Reminding Jacob, you were not the firstborn. Yes, you were twins, but not the first. You were the younger. <laughs> Lord, can, do you know how that must have felt? As if you have a wound and someone pokes the wound. How do you feel? The wound is trying to heal. The scab has been formed, right? And somebody comes around. And hits that wound and the scab is taken off and the wound begins to bleed again. How do you feel? Happy? No. But Jacob could take it with a what? Smile. Because he's remembering Bethel. This is just the chastening of God now. I am learning from my mistakes. All right, Laban, you won. All right, God, I yield. I worked seven more years to get who now? Rachel. 14 years. Then six years extra for the cattle. Right, my friends? And did Jacob ever cheat Laban? Was there opportunities to rob Laban? Yes, he never cheated Laban. And notice now, in chapter 31, that was verse 38. 20 years through verse 41, 20 years. And look at verse 3 now. What does God say to Jacob now? Let's read verse 3. And the Lord now, are we there? And the Lord said unto whom? Jacob, return unto where now? The land of thy fathers and to thy kindred. And what was the promise? And I will be with thee. What did God say now? Go back home. After how many years? 20 years. You know, friends, I say, Lord, you mean if I make a mistake, I have to wait 20 years? <laughs> 20 years for him. Jacob. Now, we learned, we, learned, we learned last week, Abraham, 10 years plus 15 more. 25 years. Amen? Isaac, 20 years. I'm so glad they live longer than many live today. <laughs> Y'all miss that. They live longer. Abraham died 175. Anybody living to 175 now? Praise God. So we don't have to wait. Y'all miss that. That encouraged me. But oh, there might be somebody here locally and somebody online have been waiting 20 years. But like Jacob, God was teaching Jacob the P word. What is it? Patience. Patience. Oh, my friends. Did Jacob drink from the bitter cup? Did he? But oh, are we drinking from that bitter cup? Must we drink from that bitter cup? Early writings, page 47 says, we all have to drink from that bitter cup. Oh, but that bitter cup can be sweetened. How can we sweeten it? It's called PEP in our steps. P-E-P. -E it's an acronym. How may we sweeten that bitter cup? P is what, my friends? P is what? Patience. E. E. Endurance. And the last P is what, my friends? We can sweet prayer. We can sweeten it. And that is what Jacob did, pep in his step for 20 years. 20 years. Remain faithful. And God now said to him, go home now. Is he going home? What is he going home for? 
He's going home to receive what now? The promised blessings. But who shows up? <laughs> who shows up now, my friends? It is Esau. And God showed me something. The very thing, the very person that Jacob thought was standing in his way 20 years before to receive the blessings was now still standing in his way 20 years after. This reminds me of something. Israel. Israel. They came to Jordan, 11-day journey. Pardon me. They came to Canaan, 11 days from Mount Sinai, and they disbelieved God. Lord have mercy. And they had to go back into the wilderness. Not 20 years now, but how, how long? 40 years. And they came right back around to the very same place. And the same giants they feared 20, 40 years earlier. Now they had to encounter 40 years later. Esau is coming. Genesis 32. And beloved, Esau is coming again. Esau is coming. And the Bible says in verse 1 through verse 6. Look at verse 6. Verse 6, it says this. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to thy brother whom? Esau. And also he cometh to meet thee with what, my friends? Roses? Roses, right? Yeah, what, what was he coming with? Singers. To welcome Jacob home, right? No, with 400 men. And what did Jacob understand that to mean? Death was coming. Death for whom? Himself, his family. And what did Jacob do? Because what Jacob did right here, we have to begin to do right now. What did Jacob do? You find Jacob searching his heart again to see if there's any unconfessed sin there. And Jacob began to repeat the promises God gave to him at Bethel. And what do we find here? Jacob found himself in a great crisis. Esau is coming. Your life is being threatened. And the only hope Jacob found was in the promises of God. This Jacob should have learned 20 years before. It doesn't matter if Isaac is about to bless Esau. Lord, you said when I was born, I will receive the blessings. Work it out your way. I will claim your words and wait. The Bible says now in verse number 10, look at this, verse number 8 rather, and, and he said, if Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, oh my father, oh my God of Abraham, Isaac, the Lord, which said unto me, what now, my friends? Lord, you said, return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal how well with thee. What was Jacob doing? You see, friends, how can I make this practical? When we find ourselves in financial hardship, you go to the word of God, and you find those promises about wealth, about riches, about money, about health. You claim those promises. Lord, you said, if I return unto you faithfully, you will return unto me. I have done my part by your strength. I don't see where the blessings are coming from, but teach me how to wait. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, shall mount up with wings as eagle, shall run and not be weary, shall walk and not faint, find promises and claim them. That's what we must do. And don't stop claiming them until you feel strong in God. 
So what if the doctor gives you a diagnosis that's not favorable? What must you do? That's your Esau. What if you can't pay the, the landlord, landlady? What must you, that's your Esau. What must you do? Claim the promises. So what if we hear the mark of the beast is coming? The son the law is nearing. And God's people will not be able to buy or sell. What are we to do? Claim the promises, Lord. You said if I do this. You will deal well with me. Lord, I have done so. And I could only do so by your strength. I will wait for your blessing now. Even if I'm at the very line between life and death, I will wait. I will not sin. I won't doubt. And this is what ministry of healing. Page 481 says, our father has a thousand ways to deliver us of which we know nothing. Did you, did you hear that, my friends? Our heavenly father has how many ways? Okay, let's count to a thousand. We may not be here. How many ways? A thousand ways to do what? To deliver us of which we know nothing. That those who make the service of God supreme will find perplexities vanish. Find what vanish? Perplexities. And a plain path before your feet. A thousand ways. So that one way that you see, you know what, Rebecca, Jacob, this is the only way to get your blessings. You have to lie to Isaac. Deceive Isaac. That was the only way they saw. But God had how many ways? Mercy. Did you get that? If I have to lie on an application to get a job, I can know for certainty that's not God's will. Later on, I'm going to wish I never worked at this office. And some of you know what I'm talking about, my friends. A thousand ways. And notice now, he began to plead and claim God's promises. And look now at verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of what now? All thy mercies and of all the truth. You could read that. Verse 11. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me, and the mother with the children. Here it is now, friends. Did God allow Jacob to find himself in prayer? What led Jacob to pray like this? What led Jacob to claim promises from God like this? It was because a crisis was coming. So what will get the church of God, Seventh-day Adventists, to find themselves in the prayer closet? Is to know, my friends, a great crisis is coming. One that will test our very souls. Hold on there. And Jacob found himself in prayer. It wasn't all night prayer with his family. No, by himself. And look what happened. In verse 24, we know this. It says, a man began to wrestle with Jacob. Who was that man wrestling with Jacob? It was Jesus Christ himself, friends. You have heard this over and over again. I want to give you a few nuggets here. Picture yourself as Jacob. Esau is coming. Danger is coming for you and your family. What would you be doing as a Christian? Right? Praying, right? To make sure you are ready to meet that crisis. All of a sudden, another trouble comes. Because Jacob did not know that person was Jesus. He thought it was an intruder, a robber. And you know, my friends, Jacob, for 20 years, you're in the field. He grew muscular. He was strong. 
and he is fighting for his life physically and fighting with God for his life spiritually. Jacob was in two troubles. Do you see it? Esau is coming. Let me see God fervently. All of a sudden, he suspects a robber has come into his house. He's wrestling with that robber now. Do you see it now? How many troubles then was Jacob in? Two. One was spiritual and one was what? Physical. What about the saints of God in the last days? What troubles are we going to encounter? A spiritual one. And what, friends? A physical one. And is he wrestling with the so-called intruder? He thought it was a robber, but something happened in verse number 25. This supposed robber touched his thigh, touched his hip, and what happened to Jacob instantly? Limping. Now, if you are walking all of a sudden on your two feet and one foot is out of joint, what happens to you now? What happens to you now? What will be your reaction? You're now falling over. Do you see it? At this point, Jacob realized who it was. Who it was? Jesus. The touch of God now, right? And when Jacob realized it was God who touched him, get the joint out of operation, foot not working anymore, Jacob slumped in the arms of God. Now, if you are wrestling, pardon me with my emotion, you're wrestling with somebody, right? Wrestling with them, all of a sudden, your foot can't move. You lose what? Balance and stability. Now, you won't drop to the ground. No, you want to grab the person, right? To hinder them from what? Hitting you, right? And that's how he grabbed Jesus. He knew now this is not an intruder. This is Jesus. It's God. It is a son of God. He knew it was a savior. And what God showed me this is this. Because Esau was coming, you will go through preliminary crises. Did, did, did you get that? Because a son the law is coming, you must first go through what? Preliminary crisis. And just as Jacob thought it was an intruder, but really God was there. Many of us, as we are going through problems now, we blame people. We blame even Satan. But who is allowing the supposed intruder? It's God. Why? He's preparing us. Why? Esau is coming. The son of the Lord is coming. If that's clear, my friend, say amen. And watch now. When Esau realized this is God, he held on to God. And Christ said something to him now. Let me go. The day breaketh. Do what now? Let me go. The day breaketh. Think now. What did Jacob say next? I will not let you go until what? Until you what? What was he claiming? What was he claiming? So in the crisis, I will not let you go until what? But here it is. Think now. Why would Jesus say, let me go? The day breaketh. Why let me go? What would cause Jesus to separate himself from us? Or even vice versa. What would cause us to separate ourselves from Christ? What? So when Jesus said, let me go, Jacob understood it as my sins are now separating me from you. That's why he responded, I will not let you go until what? You bless me. Jesus said, let me go. The day breaketh. 
What is that day that will break? Oh, we see the gleams of the glorious morning. What is that breaking of the day? The close of probation, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Who is living in that time? It's us. It's us. Our sins are separating us from Christ. And when you understand it will sever us from him, what will we say now like Jacob? I won't let you go. Until you what now? And since I know what will separate me from you, I'm going to surrender all to you now. But oh, my friends, look at this now. Listen. Then Jesus asked Jacob one question. How many times have you heard this story? Account, what was that one question? He said now in verse 27, what? Is thy name. Why? Why would Jesus ask Jacob that question? What is thy name? And what was Jacob's response? Jacob, why would he ask that question? Because 20 years earlier, Isaac, Isaac, Isaac asked Jacob, what is your name? Who are you? And what was Jacob's response? I am Esau. Full circle, my friends. Full circle. Full circle. I am Esau. Full circle. Do you know how many times I've read this, 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 this account? And I never saw that. Isaac, who are you? Are you my son? Am I? I am Esau, thy firstborn. 20 years later, the same test. What's your name? What if he said Esau? That means the sin that Rebecca, listen, and Jacob committed 20 years before was about to separate them from God forever. Let me go. The day breaketh. I will not. I want the blessing. What's your name? Correct this now because Esau is coming. What's your name? Esau is coming. This must be corrected. What's your name? And what was his response? Jacob. Okay, Lord, I see. I'm Jacob. All right. From this day forward now, your character has changed. No more be called what now? Jacob. But what now? Israel. And then... And then now, Jacob now could say, Israel now could say, I have seen God face to face. My life is preserved. Now he could meet Esau face to face. And it's not until we find God in the closet, victory over sin, that we will be ready for the coming Esau. Hold on there. Look at the screen. In great controversy, Page 618, the first sentence, as Satan influenced Esau to march against whom? Jacob. So Satan was stir up the wicked to destroy God's people when in the time of trouble, Esau is coming and as he accused Jacob, he will accuse God's people. That little company, are we ready for Esau? I'll be ready for the National Sunday Law Crisis. And notice now, watch carefully. How would Jacob wish to meet Esau? With two strong legs or limping? How? Two strong legs. But what did God do? Weaken him. For what purpose now? That Jacob, never you depend on your physical strength. To meet your present crisis, nor the future crisis, depend on me. So you do what is right and believe. What do we call that? Do what is right and then believe in me to give you victory. What do we call that? It's right doing righteousness by faith. And that's why Paul could say now, here it is, in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 12 and verse number 10. For when I am weak, finish it, you know it. For when I am weak, then, then I am what? Strong. He learned is not by your might, Jacob, not by your power, Jacob, but by my spirit will you meet the crisis and come off victorious. My friends, it's near. Are you willing to get this experience now? Like Israel, like Jacob. Did you comprehend what we covered today so far? Did you, my friends? Amen. Do you see your need to become converted before it's too late? Because many of you know you don't even have a prayer life. Promises, pastor, pro I don't even know what promises to claim. You don't study God's word. You are unprepared for the crisis. Do you see your need today, my friends? And death can come at any time. The son the law is right upon us. How do we know Esau is near? You know, friends, in verse number one through verse number six, was Esau a brother of Jacob? Was he? That means Esau would represent those who profess to be God's people. Esau didn't come with singers to approach Jacob, no. Esau came with 400 military men. So Esau and 400 military men, what do we call that? We call that church, Esau, military men, state. That's church and state coming for Jacob. Just as Judas, church, Judas, brought the soldiers, state, church, and state to crucify Jesus. Same story, friends. It's coming again. Here it is now. Before church and state unite to persecute God's people, the churches in society in America must first be united. Have they been united? They were united officially October 31st, 2017. Look at the screen right here, friends. Let me pass that. Look at the screen. In GC 444, we are told that the churches will first unite. And they did so October 31st, 2017. The harlot, the mother, the papacy, received her daughters. We have been studying this since last Sabbath evening. The daughters of the papacy have gone back home to mother. The apostate Protestant churches have gone back to mother. Now a family can't be whole with just mother and daughter. There must be what? The husband. And the husband represent the state, the civil leaders. And that's why on page 445 of Great Controversy on the screen, the husbands are coming home next. Now, here's my point. On the screen, you see, October 31st, 2017, the churches uniting with the papacy. I asked myself this question. Did all the churches unite with the papacy on October 31st, 2017 to sign the document, the protest is over? No. So what about those churches within Christianity that did not sign the document? with the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Anglicans, the Charismatics, and the rest, Pentecostals. What about these churches that did not unite with the papacy October 31st, 2017, saying the Protestant Reformation is over? How will they come in? How will they come in? Friends, God Call the disciples to be fishers of what? Men. Just hear me, friends. There are about two ways to fish for fishes. Some fishermen, they fish with nets. And they get one big catch. Other fishermen, they fish with a pole. The papacy is the Antichrist. And she's fishing with both nets 
and fishing poles. My wife calls the papacy an octopus. Multiple tentacles. So now, the papacy has just garnered in apostate Protestant churches with one tentacle. Let's end the Protestant Reformation. But how will she gather in the others? That's the question. Do you know, friends, October 31st is not the first gathering in. It's the final gathering in. This gathering in of the harlot mother getting her daughters began in 1994. When did I say? Put that date down. Look at the screen right here. What date, my friends? 19 when? 94. Look at this right here. Let's see if God gave us an inspired messenger. Look at the statement here. It says this, GC 445. One sentence. When the who? When the leading churches of what nation? The United States of America, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state now to enforce their decrees, sustain their institutions. Then America, well, then Protestant America, would have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters. That's God's Bible belief in Christians will surely result, inevitably result. The first thing you must catch, God says, the leading what, friends? The leading churches in America must first unite. Please walk with me. So who are the leading churches in America? If God says something, let us prove it, confirm it. When you hear the phrase, the leading churches in America, what would that mean? The ones with the, what? Clout, influence, what else? The one with the largest membership, right? Look at the screen right here. Who is number one in America? Catholic Church. Who else? Don't forget that. Number two, the Southern Baptist Convention. Who else is on here? Number three is what now? The Methodist. Number four, if you could see it. All right. Number five, Church of God. Number six. Number seven, Lutherans. Quickly. Number 10, Presbyterians. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Number 23, this is now the Pew Research, 2015, Pew Research, and here they are again. The largest Protestant denomination, who is number one? The Southern Baptist. Then who? Methodist. And it goes on. Question for you now, when did the leading churches in America begin to unite? The year is 19... 94. When, my friends? All right, watch carefully. Did the Lutherans join the Catholics? Yes. What year? 1999. Did the Methodists join the Catholics? What year? 2006. Move on. Did the Presbyterian go back to mother? Yes. What year? 2017. All right. What about the Anglicans, Episcopalian? They went in in 2016 officially, back to mother. But which is the largest Protestant denomination in America? Who is that? The Southern Baptist. So when did the Catholic, the mother, use her tentacles, her fishing rod, to bring the daughters back to herself? When? Watch this. In 1994, this is the Washington Post, 2017. Headline says what? Evangelicals and Catholics made their peace. When? Skip on down. One of the best known efforts to bring the two Christian traditions together. 
came in what year? 1994. What was that document called? Evangelicals and Catholics together. What year was this? 1994. The second step was in the year 2004. What year? Look at this now. This is USA Today. Or four. Headline, the bishops vote to join what? Christian Alliance. Look at this. The nations, Roman Catholic bishops. On Wednesday, they voted. What year? November 17th, 04. To join a new alliance. That would be the broadest Christian group ever formed in America. Linking whom? American evangelicals and Catholics. When? In what? An ecumenical organization for what? The first time in U.S. history. But who didn't join in 04? Who did not join in 2004 with evangelicals, Protestants, and Catholics? Who didn't join? The Southern Baptist Convention. Look at this. In fact, the evangelical Southern Baptist Convention, which has more than how many? 16 million members and is the largest Protestant denomination in the country has so far not agreed to fully join Christian churches together. So may I ask you a question now. Did GC 445 come to reality in 2004? No. Why do we say no? Because the largest influential church in America, the Southern Baptist Convention, refused to join with the Catholics. Others went back to mother, but not the most influential, the largest Christian church. So my question is, now, I'm saying, Lord, did they ever join the Catholics? They did. What year? 2009. And here is the most important thing. The papacy won the Lutherans, the Methodists, etc. on this point. Unite with me so we can end the Protestant Reformation. But the Baptists say, no, we will still protest. So the papacy could not use that beat, that hook, to bring in the Baptist. So what hook did they use now to bring in the Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention, to join with them? Let's unite to fight against immorality, climate change. Do you see it? And that's how they won over the Southern Baptist. So from 2009, the papacy had the largest denomination united with her. Look at this, friends. Watch carefully. There it is. It's called the Manhattan Declaration. From which press is this? The Baptist press. Look at this. Uh, second sentence, paragraph rather. In a 4,700 word statement, named what? The Manhattan Declaration, about 150 evangelical. Who else? Roman Catholic and who? Eastern Orthodox. Signers said they were what now? Coming together to embrace our obligation to do what now? To speak. Is that prophetic? Is that chapter 13 of Revelation? The image speaking? To speak and act in support of what? The dignity of all human beings. What else? Marriage as the union of a man and a woman. Hold on there. Hold on there. But remember now, the Lutherans believe in same-sex marriage. The Anglicans endorse same-sex marriage. Different tentacles 
to bring in different denominations. With the Lutherans, Martin Luther. The Methodists, Charles and, uh, and, and, and John Wesley. The Presbyterians, John Calvin. We can unite and sign the document. We all believe in justification by faith. But the Baptists are much more wiser. But are they really wiser? So the paper says now, let me go to them. Let's all unite to stand for morality. And did they sign on? Who signed on? Here it is now. One paragraph, the same document says what now? Among others who signed the document were whom? Were three Southern Baptist Convention leaders who signed the document. What year was this? What year was this, friends? Oh, nine. I'm going to skip some things here. I'm going to skip that. I'll come back to that. Look at this now. This is Newt Gingrich. Listen what he said. He says this. This is a new era in which what, friends? Conservative Catholics and evangelical Protestants have joined what? Forces in what they see as a defining struggle against what? Abortion, same-sex marriage, and what? Secularism. Now, what do they say must be enforced to combat immorality? Sunday. So on both sides, the Catholic Church is working to bring about a Sunday law. Look at this. The Pope has linked himself with these men. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. As a matter of fact, look at this man right here. In the second sentence, the Pope joined himself with these notable, who? Protestants. Who are they? Jeff Tunicliffe. Who else? Joel Osteen. Who else? Mr. Copeland. Who else? The Green family. Who are they? The founders of Hobby Lobby. Is Hobby Lobby also pushing for Sunday worship? Yes, they are. On what points? The Pope won't win Hobby Lobby, Joel Osteen, on the part of ending the Protestant referendum. No, they won't win those four that way. But on the point of combating immorality, they will join with the Catholics, and they have joined. Hold on. Who is Jeff Tunicliffe? Who is standing on the right of Pope Francis, looking at the picture? Or on his left hand, who is that? That's Jeff Tunicliffe. Who is he, by the way? Look at this. He is the head of the World Evangelical Alliance. How many are in the ranks? 600 million people worldwide. Who are they now uniting with? The mother of harlots. Has he won over the Pentecostals? The Pope of Rome. Have they gone back home? Let's pass this. Why? Who voted for, for Trump? Who voted for Trump? Mainly. Primarily. On what issues? Look at it, my friends. The evangelicals and whom? Catholics. On what issue? The issue of morality. Let's get Trump in so we can have a Supreme Court justice that's conservative. Look at this. And then we see now, who are these men, by the way? Jerry Falwell? Is he influential? Franklin Graham? Is he influential? All right, look at this now. Then we have Albert Muller. Is he influential? Southern Baptist Convention. Why did we all vote for Trump, even Catholics? On what issues? On what? On moral issues. And then we see, what will they call for to combat immorality in America? GC 587, a Sunday law. Are they calling for it? What did this Arizona senator call for? 
she says, we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday to see if we can get back to having a moral rebirth. It's coming, friends. Watch this now. So, 1994, 2004, right? 2009, the papacy brought back home the daughters. October 31st, 2017, he brought in the remaining daughters. The daughters are all home with mother, the harlot. Who is next to come home? The husband. Who are the husbands? How will she bring them home? We'll talk about that later on. Look at this now. Sunday worship. Then we see now, October 31st, 2017, who was the primary person to bring Protestants to sign the document, the Protestant Reformation is over. Who was this? Pope Francis. And what are we told? Headline. To understand the Pope, what must we do? Look to the Jesuits. Then what is, what is, it says, with their first Pope Jesuits are making a what? Come back. All right. Question for you. What is the aim of the Jesuits? What is the aim of the Jesuit? Last sentence. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility. It was their, what my friends? It was their aim to secure what two things? Wealth and power for what purpose? To overthrow Protestantism and to reestablish papal supremacy. When did the protest come to an end? Oct this past Tuesday, October 31st, 2017. Think about this. So what's next? The next step. To reestablish papal supremacy. What's going to happen to those who don't bow? Persecution. So how many steps are there? Three. How many have been accomplished? One, which is the end of the Protestant Reformation. What's next? Papal supremacy, which she can only do by regaining her husbands, the civil leaders of various countries. Is she working on that right now? Then comes what? Persecution. Do you see how close we are? Watch this now. When was the Pope elected? To become head of the Catholic Church. When? When, my friends? He came in March 13th, 2013, Pope Francis. When, my friends? March 13th, 2013. The question is, when did the year-long celebration begin to end the Protestant Reformation? When did the year-long celebration and the signing of documents begin what year october 31st 2016 so what is 2013 march to october 2016 that's three years and a half 2013 to 2016 is three years march 2013 March to October is seven months. That's three and a half years. The Pope took three and a half years since his, since his election for the year-long celebration to end the protest. Three and a half years. Why is that so significant? Because the papacy is the Antichrist. And Jesus in Daniel 7 Pardon me, Daniel 9, from verse 24 through verse 27. The last week has two segments. Three and a half years, the Messiah would die. Wow. The last three and a half years would bring the gospel to the world and the close of probationary time for the Jews. And the Antichrist 
from March 2013 to October 2016 brought an end. Something died three and a half years. Was Christ a Protestant? Do you see where we are, friends? Look at this. And that's why it's so difficult, hear me, to find documents or ceremonies October 31st, 2017, of the Pope signing anything. Do you know why? All the signings of documents, all the ceremonies took place last year, October 31st, 2016. So we are waiting for something to be done October 31st, 2017. It took place last year. Here it is. Wall Street Journal, October 30, 30th, 2016. Headline, Pope arrives in Sweden to do what now? To trigger this year now to end the Reformation. Pope Francis, what my friends? He highlighted two major priorities of his papacy at the start of a two-day visit, what, is, what are his two major priorities? Read on. Red words, efforts to heal the 500-year-old rift between Catholics and Protestants. That's the Jesuits' agenda. How long it took him? Three and a half years. And of course, he told you when he was elected, my papacy will be what? I feel like my papacy will last only four or five years. Well, March 2013 to, to, to November 2017 is almost four years. Four years? Four years? Four and a half years now? Yeah, four and a half. He says it's only going to be a short papacy. And hear me now, my wife and I did a calculation. The schism in the papal church with Luther, etc., was 500 years, right? Yeah. When the papacy lost her nations, her husbands, the civil leaders in 1798, it's 219 years to 2017. The bigger time period is 500 years. And the papacy took three and a half years to heal a 500th year rift. How long will he take to get back her husbands? When that was a shorter time period. 1798, 2017 is the shorter time period. Time is running out. Three and a half years, the papers did her work. What about us? Are we finding ourselves like Jacob, wrestling with God to get the experience now to meet Esau and the armies? When we come back this evening, we will talk about how she will regain her husbands. She's doing it right now. And that's why Sister White says the Sunday movement is making its way in darkness. Because most of us look at one tentacle of the harlot, octopus, the papacy. But she has many far-reaching extensions. You cannot watch one. She is the Antichrist. And once she receives her husband, a son in law is coming. She already received her daughters. The husbands are next. Am I ready? Are you ready? Are you ready online? Are we in the right location? Father in heaven, we thank you for your words today. Let these words revive and reform us. 
Save us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.